Blender sculpting tools have actually come a long way. If you remember the old days, you know that sculpting wasn't always a key focus in Blender. In fact, in its earlier years, the software was all about traditional modeling workflows, like vertex pushing, box modeling, in addition to nerves, which means sculpting tools were just an afterthought with limited functionality. But over time, however, Blender evolved to meet the growing demands in the 3D industry, to a certain extent at least, with significant updates, smarter workflows, and valuable community input. And sculpting in Blender has matured into something far more capable. But the question is, has it grown enough to be considered a solid option for working on real projects when it comes to using sculpting? Before we continue, let me tell you about one of the best software out there for creating 3D environments. If you've been creating environments for a while, you probably know about TerraGen. Basically, it is an awesome terrain generation and environment builder toolset that is both extremely powerful and versatile. From breathtaking landscapes to atmospheric effects, hyper-realistic foliage, and much more. That's why I believe TerraGen is the way to go. Not to mention it offers a free version that allows you to start creating right now. It also works really well with other 3D programs, in addition to game engines like Unreal, Unity, and so on. And by the way, PlanetSide Software recently released TerraGen 4.8, which introduced a plethora of exciting features and optimizations. Most notable is the update to the TerraGen sky in the form of a sky painting tool which allows you to literally draw clouds whatever you want. So as you can imagine, dealing with clouds has never been easier. It also helps that all these look stunning. The update also include removing the limit of high core count rendering, in addition to new export options, improved scene iteration, and so much more. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description and try TerraGen 4 right now for free. In the early 2000s, Blender's primary focus was traditional modeling. Tools like box modeling and vertex manipulation were the standard, and everything revolved around creating clean and efficient topology for animation. The industry prioritized quads in addition to triangles because they deformed predictably during animation. And this was the case especially in the 2000s when sculpting wasn't actually as popular as it is today. And since animation was the end goal for most projects, sticking to clean topology made a lot of sense. Sculpting, however, operates based on a different principle. It is all about shaping the form and adding intricate details, which often results in dense and even geometry. And Blender wasn't designed for this workflow back then. It was just a tool that wasn't built for organic modeling, or at least something that can generate the same results. Sculpting was first introduced in Blender 0.43, which was in 2007. At this stage, the tools were basic, but still functional. You could shape a model like digital clay, but there were some major limitations. If you needed more detail, the entire mesh had to be subdivided evenly, even in areas that didn't require additional resolution. This led to bloated file sizes and sluggish performance, especially when working with high-poly meshes. And despite all these challenges, sculpting in Blender provided a foundation that you can build upon. Simply put, it gave Blender artists a starting point, and over time, the tools evolved to meet the needs of more demanding workflows. Before more dynamic sculpting workflows became possible in Blender, it relied heavily on the multi-resolution modifier. This tool was introduced to give artists a non-destructive way to sculpt 3D models. With the multi-res modifier, you could add multiple levels of detail to your mesh, allowing you to work on a low-resolution base while still having the flexibility to add finer details at higher resolutions. The benefit of this workflow is that it preserved the base geometry. This was especially important for projects involving animation or rigging since the original topology stayed intact, 
You could black out large shapes on the low resolution mass and gradually refine details on high resolution layers. The multi-res workflow, however, had its limitations because it depended on the topology of the base mesh. It wasn't ideal for organic or complex shapes though. An artist often found themselves constrained by the structure of the initial geometry. But still, it was a vital step forward for sculpting in Blender, providing a structured and animation-friendly workflow. But in 2012, in Blender 2.63, B-Mesh system was introduced, which added support for Angons. While not directly related to sculpting, this update had a significant impact inside Blender. Angons made it much easier to create complex base meshes, which are often used as starting points for sculpting. Previously, Blender was limited to quads and triangles, which could be restrictive for modeling. But with Angons, you can gain more flexibility to experiment with shapes and prepare models for sculpting without worrying about the topology rules. Blender sculpting tools took a significant leap forward with the introduction of dynamic topology, or DynTopo, in Blender 2.67, and that was in 2013. This feature allowed Blender artists to sculpt without worrying about pre-planned topology, so it added detail where you needed it and left less critical areas at a lower resolution, which is really important. This flexibility made sculpting in Blender feel far more intuitive and Blender artists could focus purely on the creative process, shaping their models organically without being limited by the structure of the base mesh. And Dain Topo opened up new possibilities for concept art, character design, and other workflows where topology wasn't a concern early on. However, Dain Topo comes with a trade-off. It is a destructive workflow, meaning the mesh topology is permanently altered as you sculpt. So if you plan to animate your model or use it in a game engine, you will need to retopologize the sculpt later to create clean geometry. While this extra step can add time to the workflow, the freedom DynTopo offers during the creative phase is actually really worth it, and it makes the process more creative and more enjoyable. To deal with the uneven and messy topology that DynTopo sometimes creates, Blender introduced remeshing tools. Remeshing creates a uniform, quad-based topology across the entire model. This is particularly useful when a mesh becomes messy or when you want to refine the geometry before moving to finer details. Voxel remeshing in particular is a powerful tool. It lets you control the density of the new topology effectively resetting your mesh while preserving its overall shape. This is fine and everything, but one challenge with sculpting, whether you are using Dynetopo, remeshing, or other methods, is that they often leave behind dense high-poly meshes. These meshes aren't suitable for production, whether it be animation or something else, like game-ready assets, but especially if the model needs to be animated or exported to a game engine. This is where topology comes in. Where topology involves creating a new and a clean mesh over your sculpting. This optimized mesh is easier to animate, texture, and integrate into other projects. And Blender offers tools like snapping vertices to the surface, I mean the surface of your sculpting, and manually create edge loops. While manual retopology can be time-consuming, add-ons like RetopoFlow have streamlined the process. Even so, a solid understanding of topology is essential for achieving efficient results, and retopology is often seen as a necessary step in production pipelines, ensuring that high-poly sculpting can be turned into usable assets. So, generally speaking, in recent years, Blender sculpting tools have come a long way since the early days. Features like the multi-resolution modifier, DynTopo, and Remeshing offer a range of options for different projects. And the recent updates have also introduced advanced brushes, masking options, and color attributes, which lets you paint directly onto your sculpt. 
performance has also improved dramatically. Now, high poly sculpting used to be a struggle in Blender, but modern versions handle dense meshes far more efficiently. Not like ZBrush, but it is getting there. At the same time, Blender sculpting tools might not be specialized like ZBrush, but they have become versatile enough to handle a wide variety of tasks. Blender sculpting tools continue to improve with every release. And over the years, as I said, we have seen new brushes, performance enhancement, and hybrid workflows that combine destructive and non-destructive techniques. I think that the developers seem committed to making sculpting more efficient and accessible without losing sight of the creative aspect, which is important. And honestly, I think we're going to see even more integration between sculpting and other parts of the workflow. And Blender is already pretty good at this, but I think there is still room for improvement. I also think that we're gonna see more AI-driven tools in the future, and Blender has already started experimenting with AI in areas like denoising and animation, so it's not hard to imagine AI being used to assist with sculpting, hopefully in the mundane and more boring tasks, not the creative ones. Now, sculpting in Blender has reached a point where it can hold its own weight against other industry standard tools. It might not have all the bells and the whistles of ZBrush, but considering it is free and open source, I think it is enough to a certain extent. Plus, with the community constantly creating add-ons and sharing their knowledge with others, there is no shortage of ways to expand what Blender can do, and hopefully we'll take advantage of that. And there you have it guys. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Also, please subscribe to this channel to receive more videos like this. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.